Hello, VC, and hello to all you good people. It's Chris, your blues guy. Welcome back to Blues Guy Vinyl. Ah, cheers. Thank you for joining me once again here today. So, upon uh, recording this, today's date is April, or sorry, March the 30th. And today, officially, would have been Sonny Boy Williamson's 105th birthday. He was born on this day, 1914. So I wanted to talk a little bit today about Sonny Boy Williamson. But hang on a second here. There is actually two, count them, two Sonny Boy Williamson's. There's the original Sonny Boy Williamson, Mr. John Lee Williamson, born on this day, 1914. And then there is Alec Rice Miller, also known as Sonny Boy Number 2, who was born uh, sometime around 1910, uh, but there's discrepancies there because resource material as well as from uh, Alec Rice Miller's own mouth. Uh, there are dates given anywhere from 1885 to uh, 1901, 1910. But it's generally accepted that uh, Alec Rice Miller, Sonny Boy Number 2, was born uh, somewhere around 1910. But today I wanted to talk more specifically and focus on Sonny Boy Number 1, Mr. John Lee Williamson. Now, John Lee Sonny Boy Williamson, the original Sonny Boy Williamson, was very influential in terms of blues harp or blues harmonica playing. And the reason for this was not only because he made a, a, a huge number of recordings through the 1920s, 1930s, and even into the early 1940s, but mostly or also because of the fact that he really changed the way a lot of musicians, especially blues ensembles or trios or whatever, looked at the harmonica as an instrument. Prior, for the most part, prior to Sonny Boy Number 1, the harmonica was sort of view, viewed as being sort of a side instrument, kind of a novelty item. And um, while there were many, many talented harmonica players who would really showcase the instrument, it wasn't really taken all that seriously in the blues world, except for some exceptions like uh, DeFord Bailey, who was not only the first to perform at the Grand Ole Opry, but, Grand Ole Opry, but the first harmonica player and the first African-American to perform at the Grand Ole Opry. And he played blues harmonica and sort of country folk, country blues harmonica. And he played it and really helped to sort of bring people around to the idea to take that instrument more seriously. And the fact that so much can be done with just one tiny little harmonica. At the time, 50 cents at a music store and you could get yourself a musical instrument that you could put in your pocket and just carry around with you wherever you went. Much easier, obviously, than a piano or even a guitar. Now, the reason why he was um, sort of touted as being one of the innovators is because, as I mentioned, he, he took the harmonica out of sort of the novelty or the sidelines and brought it into the spotlight, up into the forefront. And he really used it to great effect. Um, he was an innovator in uh, a lot of different um, sort of techniques that have become sort of second nature to a lot of blues harmonica players today. Things like tongue, tongue blocking and overblowing and that sort of thing. But back then there wasn't a lot of guys that were doing that. And Sonny Boy Williamson, John Lee Williamson, number one, was one of the first to do that. And he really uh, used that tiny little instrument, this tiny little thing, and made it sound huge. Um, harmonica very commonly referred to as the Mississippi saxophone and John Lee Williamson was a big part of that. Now John Lee Williamson, the original Sonny Boy, Sonny Boy number one, was not a Mississippian. He wasn't born in Mississippi. He was actually from Tennessee and uh, once he got to be quite proficient with harmonica playing he toured around the south and through Tennessee, Mississippi, uh, Arkansas and he really made quite a name for himself and in, I believe it was the late 20s, he made his way up north to Chicago, Illinois. And he started doing a lot of uh, touring and playing around in blues clubs and uh, different sort of blues hotspots hot in and around the Chicago area. And eventually started recording in Chicago. And at the same time, 
as Sonny Boy Williamson had made his way up to Chicago and was doing a lot of recording, he met up with guys like Big Bill Brunzi. So, for example, on this Blues Classics by Sonny Boy Williamson, uh, this is Blues Classics number three. You can see right on the cover, there is John Lee, Sonny Boy Williamson, the original Sonny Boy, with Big Bill Brunzi backing him up on guitar. And John Lee, Sonny Boy Williamson, also, uh, this is, got another album, the same sort of idea here. This is Blues Classics number 20. Again, a completely different album, but again, the exact same. This is volume one, I guess, and this is volume five. Sonny Boy Williamson, John Lee Williamson. Again, the exact same photo with Sonny Boy and Big Bill. Completely different track listings, different recording dates. Uh, most of the stuff that's recorded on these albums are from the mid to late 1930s and early 40s, up until about 1944. Uh, so he did a lot of recording with Big Bill Brunzi in Chicago in the late 30s, early 40s. And also, he had quite a, uh, a great musical and professional relationship with Big Joe Williams. So you can see here I've also got a copy. This is volume uh, Blues Classics number 21. And here we've got Big Joe Williams. There he is right there with Sonny Boy Williamson number one, John Lee Williamson. There he is with his harmonica there. Now, of course, Big Joe Williams, famous for being the originator of Baby Please Don't Go. He was the original writer of the song, and he originally recorded the song in, I believe, 1933, if I'm not mistaken. And there's been uh, different, various uh, uh, versions of it uh, re-recorded by Big Joe, as well as many other uh, blues artists. It's become, a, obviously, a huge blues standard. Baby Please Don't Go has been done by everyone from uh, Muddy Waters to Van Morrison and everybody in between. So, John Lee, Sonny Boy Williamson, really made a name for himself in the Chicago Blues Clubs in the uh, late, mid to late 1930s, right up to the uh, mid-1940s, before his untimely death in 1948. Uh, unfortunately, he was murdered, actually. He was leaving a Chicago Blues Club on the south side of Chicago in 1948 after performing, and was stabbed to death. And uh, to this day, no one knows exactly uh, who committed the crime, how it happened, and what the circumstances were. So unfortunately, gone much too early, Mr. John Lee Sonny Boy Williamson, the original Sonny Boy Williamson. Now, I mentioned that there were two Sonny Boys because, like I said, there was this Alec Rice Miller, Sonny Boy Williamson number two, who in fact was born prior to the original Sonny Boy, and was older, but didn't adopt the Sonny Boy moniker until about five, six, or I think maybe even seven years after the original Sonny Boy had already been touring around and recording under the name Sonny Boy Williams. And I think most of us are probably a little bit more familiar with Sonny Boy number two, Alec Rice Miller. There he is right there. Most of us would recognize this man, the GOAT, right? Uh, from his chess records recordings through the uh, late 50s up into and including the mid-1960s. Now, with this Sonny Boy, how he gained a lot of his fame was uh, while the original Sonny Boy Williamson, John Lee, was up north touring and recording in and around Illinois and uh, other areas in and around Chicago, um, this Sonny Boy Williamson was making a name for himself by staying down in the south. Um, he was touring around in the Chitlin circuit, and he also, for a while, toured around with Big Joe Williams. So, go figure. Big Joe, I guess, wanted to stay consistent with the Williamsons, and he recorded with both the original and he backed up Sonny Boy Number 2. But Sonny Boy Number 2 sort of garnered a lot more of his fame and notoriety, notoriety by hosting the uh, King Biscuit Time Hour radio show out of uh, Helena, Arkansas on KFF Radio. Uh, through the uh, 1940s and after it was really only after Sonny Boy number one John Lee Williamson was murdered in Chicago that Alec Rice Miller Sonny Boy number two made his way up to Chicago and started doing a lot more recording up there prior to that he stayed in 
pretty much in and around the Helena, Arkansas area, and um, did a lot of stuff in and around Memphis as well before eventually making his way up to Chicago. And when he finally did go up north to Chicago, um, he was very quickly brought into the fold at Chess Records and became part of their roster of blues artists. Now, the thing with Sonny Boy number two, uh, Alec Miller, is because he lived to be quite a bit older and lived to uh, lived well into the nineteen uh, the mid nineteen sixties. Uh, there's a lot more of his catalog or his library. He was able to do a lot more recordings, and also by the time he was doing a lot more of uh, the bulk of his his recordings, things had sort of changed. And uh, when John Lee Sonny Boy Number no. One was recording back then, the the recordings were done on a seventy eight. So you really they were called songs were called sides. So you had to walk into a studio and have two songs or two sides. One song on each side of the record, then they would press your record, and then they would release it to the public for sale. Whereas by the time Sunny Boy number two has come along, now everything's for the most part being recorded in album form and then singles are released from that album. This is a copy of Sunny Boy Williamson number two. This is my life on chess. And I think I've showed this, shown this one here before. I think it was on my, uh, my vinyl tag for 2019. But this is a beautiful chess recording, double album set of Sonny Boy Williamson. And it's a fantastic gatefold. It gives you a nice sort of background story or a little bit of um, uh, an edited biography, a little bit of the story, my story. John uh, Sonny Boy Williamson's story. And this, this album is going to be a lot of the stuff that most of us are going to be familiar with from Sonny Boy No. 2 at Chess Records, like Fattening Frogs for Snakes, uh, Your Funeral, My Trial, uh, One Way Out, Nine Below Zero. Uh, but he really cut his teeth on re-recording a lot of the stuff that the original Sonny Boy had recorded a decade or so earlier. So the original Sonny Boy recorded songs like um, uh, Good Morning Little School Girl um, and uh, My Little Machine, Jive in the Blues, Check Up on My Baby. Now, the original Sonny Boy had penned and recorded a lot of these original tunes. And then Sonny Boy Williamson number two had basically had come along and re-recorded and reworked a lot of these original recordings and basically made them his own. And a lot of people at that time were saying that Sonny Boy number two could play Sonny Boy number one songs just as well, if not better, than the original Sonny Boy. So at first he was basically just reworking the original Sonny Boy songs. But uh, after a while that can only take you so far. So then he did start writing a lot of original tunes and also there were some tunes being uh, written for him by Willie Dixon, of course, at Chess Records. So that's where you get uh, songs like Fattening Frogs for Snakes and Nine Below Zero. Just going to show a couple of more here because Sonny Boy number two was also, we're lucky enough that because he lived well into the mid-1960s, he was part of these blues and rhythm and blues and folk music packages that uh, were sent to, that went over to uh, to Europe and to England in the 19 uh, early 19 to mid 1960s as part of these big blues packages with Marty Waters, Howlin' Wolf, Matt Guitar Murphy, um, guys like Lonnie Johnson and women like Victoria Spivey and Sippy Wallace and uh, Alec Rice Miller, Sonny Boy Number no. Two, was often part of those packages and it would go over there. So he became quite popular. Um, in Europe, in England, France, Germany, Holland, and Belgium, and even did a lot of recording there as well. And uh, he was a huge influence on a lot of the, the British bluesmen that would later on bring the music back to the United States as part of the British invasion. And you know what? Alec Miller, Sonny Boy number two, he was pretty cool because uh, he recorded with a lot of rockers as well, right? So you've got Sonny Boy Williamson here with the animals. Uh, Sonny Boy Williamson also doing uh, some recordings with uh, Eric Clapton and the Yardbirds as well. So a lot of us uh, have this album or have seen this album as well. 
The one thing that's very confusing, and I want to warn all of you about, it's not so much on vinyl, but once they started reissuing a lot of this older stuff onto CDs in the 80s and 90s, the problem was that they would uh, reissue Sonny Boy Williamson number one, the original Sonny Boy, John Lee Williamson material on a, on a CD, but then the cover, the photo that they would use, would often be Sonny Boy number two, Alec Rice Miller's photo. So you look at the cover and you think you're buying Sonny Boy number two, you get it home, you pop it into your CD player, and it's actually stuff from, a, you know, five to ten years earlier, and it's Sonny Boy number one. So you've got to kind of really be careful with a lot of these reissues that were coming out in the 80s and 90s on, on CD especially. Uh, for some reason, it seems like either the label didn't do their own homework, or somebody got confused somewhere along the way, or perhaps they weren't even aware at that time that there were, in fact, two Sonny Boy Williamson's that had been recording often a lot of the same songs. Um, Sonny Boy number one, like I said, recording a lot of the stuff up north in Chicago, while Sonny Boy number two stayed in the south and did a lot of his recording in and around Helena and Memphis, and then afterwards he made his way up into Chicago in the late 40s and early 50s. So, I hope that clears things up. I hope I didn't add chaos to confusion with the tale of two Sonny Boys. Sonny Boy Williamson number one, the original, John Lee Williamson, and Sonny Boy number two, Alec Rice Miller. So, happy birthday, Sonny Boy, and thank you very much for all the fantastic blues harp playing and all the influence that was left in your wake. If it wasn't for you and really bringing that that little instrument, this little harmonica. If it wasn't for you bringing this little thing into the spotlight, who knows where Blues Harp would be today. So thank you, John Lee Williamson, and thank you to all of you for joining me here today at uh, Blues Guy Vinyl. Really appreciate it. And if you haven't already, please let me know what you think down below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. So in the meantime, that's going to do it for today. And don't forget, keep digging and keep spinning. Thanks a lot, everybody, and happy birthday, Mr. John Lee Williamson. Take care. Bye-bye.